Bonjourno, salam, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ad Hamazia. I'm an associate fellow with the Chatham House MENA program. And my claim to fame is that I'm a good friend of, of ISPI's. Uh, I'm incredibly delighted to welcome you all to today's uh, ISPI Med webinar event, the GCC at 40, Prospects and Challenges on the Path of Recovery. So the event is organized within the framework of the seventh edition of the Rome Med Dialogues, which is going to be out, we hope, inshallah, in person from 2nd to 4th December. Uh, and now before sort of introducing our, our wonderful speakers, our incredible panel, some housekeeping and a very brief event intro and some context, if I may. So the event is being held on the record, is being recorded. Alongside Zoom, it is also being live streamed on the MED website, I believe on YouTube as well, and, and also on ISPI's Facebook and Twitter profiles. A recording will be available following the event on the MED website, and I ask attendees to submit questions throughout the event using the Q&A function or, or other comment section. So right away, marhaba, please do. Uh, and of course, feel free to share your name and affiliation. So some brief context, a mini chronology. So the GCC celebrated its 40th birthday last Tuesday, Eid Milad Saeed to the GCC, the charter having been signed on the 25th of May, 1981 at Abu Dhabi's Intercontinental Hotel, the HQ located, of course, in the largest member state in its capital in Riyadh. The population in 81, I was checking last night, was around 15 million, believe it or not, quadrupling over the past four decades. So birth rates plus that little thing called imported labor, of course, responsible for these numbers. And, and while the establishment of the GCC in 81 had been preceded by meetings in the mid 70s, 75 in Jeddah, 76 in Muscat, and of course those included Iran and Iraq, may I add, it was just years after independence for many of their members. So there's some, what could be described as tectonic events across the region, which really served as a catalyst for the formation of this entity, GCC. So these events included, of course, the Iranian revolution, uh, Egypt at the time treacherous peace treaty of Israel, God forbid anybody should normalize of Israel, in March 79, which of course led to a, a decade-long expulsion uh, of, of, of Egypt from the Arab League, the seizure of Mecca in late 79, and perhaps most importantly, the Iran-Iraq war, which began, to, uh, be, which began in earnest in, in 1980. So throughout the past four decades, we've had several events and movements which have tested the limits of the C and GCC cooperation within the bloc, uh, and these have, of course, been both exogenous and endogenous. So let's quickly revisit just a couple of, uh, just a few, um, a few key, key moments. I'm going to run through these. 85, 86 oil price collapse, invasion of member state Kuwait in 1990, followed by a decade of, of relatively low oil prices, succession issues, family issues in the, in the uh, mid 90s in, in one of the Gulf states. 9 11, 2003 invasion of Iraq, some uh, offering space, some against. And then, of course, uh, run up to, uh, of course, the big one, of course, the Arab Spring. Uh, let's, we can come back to the Peninsula Shield deployment later. Uh, and then, of course, run up to the aftermath, uh, run up to and the aftermath of the JCPOA in 2015. We had the intra GCC diplomatic in 20, uh, rift in 2014. And then, of course, the more significant, uh, profound dispute in uh, 2017, three and a half year um, boycott, or uh, depending on your uh, language, uh, some people would call it uh, a blockade. So here we are almost six months after the Lula declaration uh, with a cold reconciliation between Qatar and UAE in Bahrain on the one hand, slightly warmer engagement between Saudi and Qatar, Vienna talks underway. Uh, we have the dual challenges of the pandemic, the energy transition uh, and so on and so forth. And finally, worthy of note, lurking in the shadows are these sort of long held territorial disputes, which the GCC has, has, has played a role in. So, so today we'll sort of take stock of achievements, challenges, a roadmap, uh, potential synergies ahead. I was speaking with a friend a few months ago in anticipation, thinking about GCC at 40 and all the various dates on the calendar. And he joked, uh, American friend, that, that the GCC is suffering from a, a midlife crisis and maybe needs to go back to school or go back to uni. And I quipped, maybe vocational uh, qualification could be necessary or value adding. And, and perhaps rather than a diet, expansion could help maybe uh, put the capital C back into cooperation. And on the letter C, just a few to always think about consumer markets, competition, comparative advantage, conflict, contradictions, controversy, uh, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So the format for today is more of a conversation style. Think of us all being a cafe in the sun. We'll start with a, a, little, a little bit of a conversation around achievements. Uh, then we'll go on to challenges, shortcomings, 
uh, obstacles to closer cooperation, and then we'll think about the, the possibilities and roadmap ahead. So please start piling in any questions. I'm very pleased to say we have a blockbuster panel. We're covering a lot of mileage, literally and metaphorically. So DC to London via UAE to Tokyo, right? Uh, so uh, very anti-Green anti, anti -green deal. Um, so Dr. Abdullah Ba'aboud, who, who is a visiting professor chair of the state of Qatar, I believe now at Waseda University. We have Dr. Alham Fakhru, senior analyst uh, of the Gulf States at ICG, the International Crisis Group, and Dr. Karen Young, who is senior fellow uh, and director of the Economics and Energy Program at the Middle East Institute. So Abdullah, if you could kick us off, could you sort of, as far as regional organizations go, what have been the, the main achievements of the GCC from a political and functional perspective and anything on origins that I missed? And if you could also, since you have a, a professorship, professor title, could you give us a, a grade, you know, A, B minus, C plus, where is the GCC at 40? Over to you, Abdullah. Uh, the last question is the most difficult question, but uh, uh, thank you, Adil, for this uh, invitation for, and uh, for ISPA for the uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you and to be with this very distinguished panel. I'm uh, uh, and friends uh, that I've known for a long time and uh, always value their uh, insights. Um, Adil, um, when we talk about the GCC, what is it? It's a regional organization that was, as you said, created, created in 1981 because of the uh, dynamics of uh, the region. You know, those, those Gulf states obituary have been written a long time ago that they were going to disappear after the British withdrawal. However, um, we, what we have seen is uh, a lot of resilience that has happened. And that, to one extent, to a certain extent, some of it is due to their cooperation and to the GCC itself, but that's not the only reason uh, as well. And the GCC was also created because of um, um, uh, because of uh, um, fraction or um, problems in the Arab regional system, and that is the Arab League, as you correctly said, with the. Uh, um, Egypt uh, peace process and the movement of the Arab League from Cairo, uh, 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 etc. So there was there was uh, a problem with the regional system um, within the Arab League. Um, so these uh, monarchies got together. Initially, the idea was to include other uh, countries like Iran and Iraq, as you correctly said, and even Yemen was was considered to be uh, part of that. However. It ended up by being an exclusive club of monarchies uh, in, in the Gulf. Of course, if you want to compare it to um, the Arab League and to the Maghreb Union, then you would give it a higher grade. If you were to compare it to other regional organizations, then I would uh, 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 be hesitant to say that it will not get the above C. Uh, but uh, uh, of course there has been, you know, we shouldn't uh, really just uh, disqualify what has been achieved. There has been a lot of achievement in this uh, regional cooperation. Obviously the most achievement uh, uh, from, you know, at least my perspective is, is the creation of what is known as the Gulf identity. And the idea that we all here uh, live in this area together and we have shared common interests and common values. And of course, um, because of that, you know, we also have uh, similar views uh, to, um, you know, the politics and the economics and what challenges we are facing. Um, although it was created for political, for economic, for uh, security reasons, it ended up being more of a, a, an economic integration. And that is always the case in any regional organization. It's always the easiest way, and you know, to start with the lower. Um, um, you know, lower uh, low, low the ladder and then climb up. So we've seen there has been a number of uh, uh, economic uh, agreements, which I, I'm sure my uh, uh, colleagues here will uh, uh, talk about. But in terms of uh, politics, there was a lot of political cooperation uh, as well between the Gulf states in terms of, you know, their standing in uh, uh, and views and political issues in, in the region, whether it's the Arab-Israeli conflict, whether it's with Iran, um, but, you know, of all political um, uh, points, they had kind of a similar understanding and they represented themselves uh, jointly in international fora, you know, well, the United Nations, the Arab League, etc. And most important, I think, 
is they have acted as a group negotiating with the EU, with the United States, with China, and um, uh, trying to form uh, some kind of a free trade agreements, which of course many of them have not succeeded, but there were some success. At least there was a free trade agreement signed with certain countries, but uh, at the moment, uh, you know, the major countries have not, um, they haven't been very successful with that. Uh, they have also created, you know, security architecture, which is the PSF, the Peninsula Shield, and they have also created uh, a central command, uh, et cetera. Now we can question how effective they were. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a different matter. But overall, they were moving slowly in the right uh, direction, uh, trying to create some kind of a momentum to create a regional organization that encompasses um, you know, the, these countries that they share uh, those common values and common threats and, and common challenges. And they were trying to, to work with, get with together. And regional integration is never easy. Um, even in, in, the, in, uh, in the European Union, uh, there is always fraught with um, problems. And I think uh, in the Gulf states, the problems are, of course, um, uh, even more because of the nature of the politics uh, in, in, in this region. Uh, I don't know how long you want me to go on no, for. No, but, uh, no, no. B before I sort of ask uh, Ilham Okar if they want to sort of add to any of these particular points, if, if you could um, if you could just say maybe something. So you, on, the, on the political systems point, the fact that they had similar political, political systems, one of the reasons why they came together, is it fair to say that... Um, there was a, a, a you know a, a, resi a resilience uh, capital that came with the organization over the 40 years even if there were you know ebbs and flows ups and downs or or do you think on on the grand scheme maybe uh, some other trajectories counterfactuals could have led us to a better place well i think that political system uh, obviously is always been um uh, played that it it is the reason that these gulf states stay together and I, I would like to question that uh, 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 as well, because I think that political system has also created some of the problems uh, uh, in the region. Because we are talking about monarchies here, about royal family, tribal uh, uh, system. And these tribal systems and royal families have also had, come, they came to the organization with a baggage of feud and uh, rivalries and, uh, and, and disagreements, and uh, not only between the, the ruling uh, elites and the ruling families themselves, but also border disagreements and historical antagonism, uh, and of course, dynastic rivalry that has been going on. And I think this is, this is as Blake to the GCC uh, 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 movement towards more you know, functional uh, uh, organization and delayed their integration process because you know, you've mentioned um, you know, the conflicts that has happened within, uh, within the organization. There's a lot of mistrust uh, because of that. There is a lot of uh, you know, bad feeling and unfortunately they have not been able yeah. to leave that baggage behind when they enter the organization. The organization is very much a club of monarchies yeah. um, uh, that is exclusive. And also there is no kind of in, um, in, uh, interjection of um, you know, political forces or, uh, or, or of course the population. Uh, they hardly play any role and there is no consultation uh, as well. So it's, it's a very much an intergovernmental, uh, inter-elite uh, uh, cooperation project. Yeah. project. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abdul. We'll come back to sort of challenges shortly, but if we could stick on the positives, at least at the beginning. Uh, Ilham, could you take us through a little bit on, on achievements from a security perspective? And I know you had a few points perhaps on, on the origins and anything that wasn't wasn't touched upon. Sure, thanks, Adil. Um, it's great to join you here today and great to be in the company of, of colleagues and friends. Um, so I'll say a few words as well, just to add to what Dr. Abdullah mentioned on the founding of the GCC. So certainly it was founded in the context of, of several regional upheavals and crises, including the Iran-Iraq war, including the Iranian revolution. Um, but certainly these weren't the only factors that, that were the cause of the GCC coming together. Um, this desire to create a Gulf identity, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned, was absolutely part of it. It's enabled the leaders to, to project a separate sub-identity that was 
complementary but still different to just Arabness. I think we take for granted today the fact that we can speak of the Gulf as a category of its own, but that wasn't really the case um, back then and founding the GCC, establishing it, um, helped kind of um, project the sub-identity. Arab unity as well, um, I think if we remember just 10 years prior, uh, the UAE, Bahrain and Qatar had been in talks, well the seven states that now form the, the, the UAE, um, had been in talks to form a single union and that hadn't happened, but but speaking of integration in a regional type forum was still very much on the agenda. So it's, it's part of a history of regional efforts at regionalism as well. Um, I'll move to areas of, of cooperation and security. Uh, the most successful area of, of cooperation in the GCC has been in, in economics, um, but um, you know, in the area of security as well, it's, it's been kind of mixed. These are states that are highly concerned about their security, but the main model for security in the Gulf from the independence of the smaller states until today has been to export it to larger powers and to the US in particular, and uh, not on a regional basis as the GCC, but on a bilateral one-to-one -one basis. And if you look at kind of the scale of, of US foreign troops in the Gulf, the extent of this model becomes clearer. There's about 7,000 US troops in Bahrain, around 13,000 in, in Kuwait and Qatar each, um, and in the UAE about 5,000. Um, uh, uh, so regional security integration, either between the GCC countries themselves or between the GCC as a unit and the United States has taken a backseat to this kind of bilateral uh, security relationship with the US. Um, the other factor really hindering security cooperation is, is the issue of a lack of supranational powers. The GCC is more of a forum for consultation and coordination between the member states, but there's a lack of, of powers supranationally as such, which means that it can't really act um, beyond, uh, beyond that capacity. Um, but having said that, I think it would also be mistaken to dismiss uh, cooperation entirely. There have been points of cooperation in, in the area of security. Um, and some of these do also reflect US concerns in counterterrorism in particular, um, kind of in view of that bigger model that I, that I just mentioned. So several landmarks in the year 2000, there was a joint defense agreement committing all GC mem GCC member states to the principle that an attack on one is an attack on all. There was a counterterrorism strategy jointly um, in, in 2004 and in 2006 a permanent committee for countering terrorism was also created so a lot of terrorism uh, cooperation um, but I think the most significant area um, where they came together in security was the creation of the Peninsula Shield Force in 1984 at, at quite early on this is oriented towards combating external military aggression it has about 40,000 uh, soldiers and Peninsula, Peninsula Shield has been deployed three times um, in the history of the GCC. The first time was to help liberate Kuwait after the, the Iraqi invasion of 1990. The second time was to protect Kuwait after the 2003 Iraq invasion by the United States. And the third time, and, and really most notably, was to assist Bahrain during the 2011 uprising. GCC Peninsula Shield units were deployed to guard the vital installations to free up capacity of local police forces to, to manage uh, the protests. Um, now, GCC defense cooperation, I think it's important to point out as well, it's persisted even at periods of peak crisis. So even during the 27 fallout between Qatar and its neighbors, um, there, there still was some low level cooperation, which is, which is important to note. I think it indicates a sense of resilience, even though what we're talking about is, is fairly minor. I think it's important to note that it has been resilient. Um, during the height of the crisis, Qatari military forces were conducting joint military exercises exercises as part of Peninsula Shield. Um, and there were as well the annual summits that were still uh, happening diplomatically uh, as well. Um, so I think, I mean, that's kind of most of, most of what I want to say. It, most of the good stuff. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's, you know, I think it really depends how we evaluate this again. And there's been a lot of discussion of how do we evaluate the GCC? If we want to compare it to something like the EU, then of course, we're going to be very critical. But if we think of it more as a forum for consultation um, and one in which economic cooperation has been more successful, I think we can be kinder um, to its accomplishments. Absolutely. No, thank you so much. I think I think one thing, if, uh, I know Abdullah did an MBA, so the balanced scorecard of poll, econ and security might be an interesting way to look at this. But but Karen, um, Abdullah rightfully sort of pointed to the economic wins. 
You've lived in the UAE. We've all spent time in the Gulf or we're from the Gulf. We've lived in the Gulf. The skyscrapers that were uh, that, that are there today were not there in 81 in most of the, the states. The development has been phenomenal, incredible. Um, you know, nobody could even have, you know, dreamt of what, you know, what some of these oases looks like for all of the, 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 the negatives and the positives. What have been the, achieve the achievements in the economic realm? Um, could, could you take us through some of these, uh, Karen? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Angel, and, and great to be with you all. Um, you know, I guess I have to fall back on on more. I mean, Elham and, and Abdullah have both sort of, sort of, you know, reinforced this idea that the economic linkages have been more successful. But in my mind, actually, the success of the organization is really more on these sort of normative and intangible um, features, which is, you know, the sense that these systems of governance, this family rule, this club of monarchies, as, as Abdullah said, has shown to be legitimate and they reinforce each other's legitimacy. Um, and so, yeah, in the early 1980s, the beginning of, you know, sort of, you know, 10 years of the state in some places, this was really important and that, that has endured. Um, and so that has allowed this kind of sub-identity to form, but also has allowed some learning to, uh, to continue and learning in terms of shared patterns and ideas of development, shared ideas about, is it, yes, is it possible to have a resource-rich economy to be dependent on um, carbon resources, hydrocarbons for export, and to make that work? And, you know, on balance, the answer is yes. Um, we've seen tremendous wealth created um, in these economies for citizens, the delivery of social um, services to citizens, the ability to achieve you know, some pretty um, substantial gains in, in human development in terms of education, access to healthcare. Um, you know, so from a development perspective, from an economic development perspective, um, the GCC has, has done a good job. Now the organization itself, you know, didn't necessarily say, oh, these are our benchmarks and this is what we're going to do by, you know, 2000. No, I mean, these were generally national development objectives. But the learning that's occurred in terms of comparing, you know, vision plans or, you know, basically sectoral development has, has been sort of copycatted from one place to the other. So if we think about, you know, where was the first real financial center and banking sector that proved that this location, this geography could be um, a point of, of connection, that was Bahrain, right? So Bahrain really developed that idea, proved the case, and then it developed in Dubai, it's trying to be developed in Riyadh. Um, and uh, now in Doha as well. The same thing on tourism, the same thing on logistics, uh, you know, the development of, of national airlines, the development of ports. These were things that started in you know, one location and then copycatted to others. Um, and so I think the GCC has proven useful for basically um, you know, the transfer of those ideas. Now you get dualities, you get um, you know, redundancies, that's certainly true, and that's one on the negative side. But if you think of it in terms of the positive, this, this has been good. Now, in terms of the, um, the common market, the notion that, you know, you could have um, a region which would, you know, allow more open trade between borders. The problem is, of course, the GCC states don't necessarily manufacture very much. And so that notion of the agreement has not been necessarily that uh, useful or productive. But in terms of the rights of citizens as investors um, in the member countries, that's, you know, that's been a pretty big deal. And so when we think about the generation of wealth of, of family-owned businesses, um, of the ability to own property and to have you know, rights as citizens across the GCC um, as, a, as a member, as a citizen of a member state, um, that's an enormous benefit. Now, of course, it has been challenged, right? Um, and so the longevity and the durability of that right, I think, is, is in question. Um, but other kind of uh, economic successes with limitations, we can think about the ability to share electricity through the common uh, grid system. Underused could now, now still perhaps find some, um, some, some value and some exploitation um, in a good way, common rail system, um, also never really got off the ground, but you know, maybe still in the future. Um, but these are essentially economies which, um, which copy from each other, learn from each other, and ultimately are competing with each other. Absolutely, thank you so much, Karen. Abdullah, 
mentioned a moribund organization called the Arab Maghreb Union earlier in the, in the, in the uh, conversation. So intra-regional trade at UMA is uh, 3%, lowest on the planet. Intra-GCC non-oil trade is, is 10%, right? And this is the point on tradables versus non-tradables. But um, sort of free for all, and feel free to come in, whoever wants to jump in. On this point of competing visions and redundancies, um, from a you know, challenges perspective, have we seen more... Uh, have we seen more issues as these smaller states have become more assertive vis-a-vis -vis the hegemon Saudi Arabia? And, and here what I'm getting at is 20, Vision 2035, Vision 2040, um, differences in the VAT approach, for example. I've joked with Garen in the past about starting up a, a, a smuggling racket where we can buy expensive perfumes in, in, uh, in Qatar and sell them in Saudi Arabia, uh, a, a small markup. T tell me, wh where is this going? And... and is there a way that we can think about, um, you know, commonalities beyond this sort of zero sum, you know, port capacity beyond what is needed, or or is it just the politics stupid? Well, I think there's a there's a larger point in terms of you know where the GCC and these individual economies fit into the the wider regional economy and the global economy, and that's really what's different since 1981, right? And so think about, you know, the UAE really as a leader as both a destination of foreign direct investment in the region, but also as the most important source um, in MENA uh, of greenfield uh, foreign direct investment. So if you want to think about the growth of the wider region, you look to the GCC. Now, you know, it not all have equal capacity, Right. And so this is the difference. Um, you know, and the UAE certainly stands out in terms of diversification efforts and in terms of its capacity for um, for the provision of external finance, you could say that. Um, but, you know, Saudi Arabia is also a pretty substantial large economy. And, and these states, in terms of their political orientation, are more activist um, in their willingness to deploy resources um, for political and foreign policy objectives. Um, and we've seen this certainly accelerate. Um, since 2011, um, and you know their their capacity now is um, is you know rivals that of you know in many places what what China invests in the wider MENA region. So it's, it's nothing to you know kind of toss aside. These are these are major uh, major players in uh, in Horn of Africa, across the Middle East, Levant, uh, even into Pakistan. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I want to come back to, to to the GCC functionality, and Ilham pointed to something really important, which is. The supranational point and specifically thinking about what we've just uh, you know seen over the last three and a half uh, years from january um is the point on specifically this article nine of the charter right unanimity versus majority substantive what is substantive really and on that point what is sovereignty right uh al jazeera can al jazeera do what it wants so i, I want to come back to this point um abdullah do we need to revisit the charter was it done in a hurry in the early months of 1981. And then after that, I'd like to go to Elham and talk about foreign policy divergence, because there's this idea that, you know, regional organizations tend to do better when they have a common threat perception, not a divergent one, or at least the priorities are different. Abdullah, please. Yeah, thank you, Adel. I, I think the, the charter was, uh, as you correctly said, was done in a hurry. Um, it, it was, there was a window of opportunity for the GCC to be created. If it wasn't for uh, the Iran and Iraq were actually engaged in, in the war, not only that there was you know, a threat from there, but also that created the window of opportunity because to have a regional organization that does not include Iran and Iraq, if they were not in the war, it would have been impossible. So while the two protagonists were actually on the war, it allowed uh, the GCC, uh, the monarchies, to, to get together and create their own uh, organization. So they were under, um, and, under pressure. So they wrote that, that, that charter uh, under pressure, and they had like a very small window of opportunity, and they went for it. And I think, you know, hats off to them. They, uh, they did what they could do uh, uh, at that time. You know, you have to also remember, it wasn't easy to get, you know, six monarchies to agree to um, uh, that, that charter. What actually should have happened, uh, like other organization is, um, you know, maybe after a decade or something, though, that, that charter had to be um, revisited, you know, like uh, the EU, for example, uh, with, with new uh, agreements, uh, 
uh, and so on and upgrade it to take uh, uh, a stock of realities. That charter stood in time. It was written in 1981 under uh, duress, under pressure. And it stood in time and it hasn't uh, really developed. And I think this is something that needs to be revisited. The charter basically, as you correctly said, creates the GCC, um, <clears throat> creates the objectives of the GCC, you know, cooperation, coordination, et cetera, et cetera, leading to unity, which, you know, it doesn't spell out what unity means. Um, it also creates the institutional uh, framework, which is the Supreme Council, the head of the states and the decision making within the Supreme Council. Um, it creates the uh, Secretariat General, uh, and by its very name, uh, this is the executive uh, uh, board, as it were, or the executive body. Uh, it's very much a secretariat rather than a commission like the European Union. It doesn't have um, any supranational uh, um, powers, uh, as it were. It also created the Consultative Council, uh, appointed, um, but uh, ha was hardly engaged um, by, you know, by the member states or by the leaders. It only um, uh, responds to what uh, the Supreme Council wants it to do. It also created something called um, um, Dispute Resolution Mechanism, Dispute Committee, that was never actually activated. Uh, and you would wonder why you know, because you do need uh, a dispute committee because there are agreements and there is interpretation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that dispute committee has never been activated. So I think uh, now when it's, it's uh, 14, mid, uh, facing its midlife crisis, uh, uh, as it were, uh, I think it's maybe a good time to revisit uh, this and to see, is this a uh, constitution or charter still relevant to what we want and are they you know things have changed not just the political landscape but also the uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, issues you know people have become more educated there is young aspiring people uh, and, and you know they want some share in what is going on the countries uh, in the region are also moving more towards constitutional democracies in one way or the other we can see we're seeing elections you know, Shura councils, parliaments, etc. Why not have similar thing, for example, within uh, the GCC and involve young people? Why does it just stay to be a very um, exclusive club, not just amongst the monarchies, but also amongst uh, the royals uh, themselves and the heads of uh, tribes? I think we need to move beyond that because the GCC states is now our modern states, um, you know, helped, uh, thanks to oil and gas, They've created, uh, you know, a fantastic infrastructure. Uh, there is potential in terms of business and economic um, uh, integration. But at the top, they are still kind of, um, uh, you know, student time, uh, uh, very much like, you know, uh, the Middle Ages. And I think we need to move beyond that and uh, to move to a, a real modern state. Of course, respecting the uh, the system at the same time and the monarchies. It, it, it sounds like there's a Sisyphean struggle between personalization and institutionalization and uh, paradoxes and, uh, and and cooperative elements. Ilham, could you take us through a little bit around, um, you know, the, the, the old adage of there's more than that unites us than divides us. How many foreign policies do we have in the region and what are the, the key uh, pressure points, if you like? Sure, Adli. We have quite a few foreign policies. Um, and actually, I think this is a point worth elaborating on. The, really, the, the challenge facing the GCC in terms of the foreign policy differences between its member states. Um, I mean, these erupted most visibly in the 2017 fallout, but there were also signs of it earlier in 2014, for example, when Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Bahrain all withdrew their ambassadors from Qatar. I mean, this was kind of a, a mini fallout. It was a predict predictor of things to come, but I think it also shows how things can escalate when, when mediation is, is not really, doesn't really resolve the, the, the problem. Um, but the main issue um, really, at least in terms of the Qatar crisis, um, was for the UAE, again, each, each of the three blockading states had their own issues uh, with Qatar. For the UAE, it was Qatar's support for political Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood, which it views as a threat. For Saudi, you know, it was also that Qatar was too close to Iran, too independent in its foreign policy. And for Bahrain, um, Qatar's support for opposition actors uh, in Bahrain. And Al Jazeera, I think, was an issue for all of them. They were all sort of unhappy with its coverage uh, that was fairly critical. Now, 
in the 2014 crisis, the ambassadors were reinstated. The Riyadh agreement was signed um, effectively, whereby you know all of the states basically promised not to interfere in the internal affairs of one another. Um, uh, and, and and you know, but this didn't really solve it. Um, it re-erupted again in 2017 on the same accusations uh, made towards Qatar. Uh, that, then the list of 13 demands followed that, um, and this persisted for a while. I think what's what's interesting to note about this as well is it's it's one of the first times really that citizens were involved, and it it really expanded beyond the state. Um, Gulf governments have had their disputes in the past, but this really filtered down into the media, into the into the more local level, and overnight the the narrative really changed from being this Khalij Nawahid, we are one. Gulf, which was really pushed in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, this idea of Gulf unity was really, really um, kind of promoted uh, at all levels. Uh, and then almost overnight, it just became that actually, no, um, we, we have a problem here. Um, so the issue is, is not just the dispute between them, of course, it's one thing to have an internal dispute, but also the way in which it was exported further afield to other countries. Um, places like Libya, Sudan, and Somalia, where the various states backed different actors and different parties along the same lines as the rift. And I think it's it's worth going into this a bit just to show really the, the consequences of these foreign policy differences. So in Libya, for example, Qatar, along with Turkey, backed the government of national accord, um, and the UAE acted in opposition by backing Haftar in Sudan, following the overthrow of Bashir, who was seen as being too close to to the Muslim Brotherhood and to Qatar, the UAE and Saudi, then really pushed to gain influence in the country by providing large amounts of aid, large amounts of aid effectively, you know, sidelining Qatar in the in the kind of post Bashir future. In Somalia, it's the reverse somewhat. Qatar, along with Turkey, are the ones that have really invested there in infrastructure, roads, and ports, and you know. There was also a rift with the UAE and the Somali government um, over issues I won't go into, the, uh, but it also pushed the UAE to support breakaway states like Somaliland and Puntland. So across these three areas, you can see the Gulf states take on opposing positions and, and backing the actors uh, you know, that are aligned to them. And so this has had the effect of, of deepening conflict in other areas and places outside the Gulf. And I think that's that's really one of the most dangerous things about this is it's not, it wasn't just within the Gulf, it, it exported uh, beyond that. Um, uh, I mean, can, can we, can we come back to the, the big I, not Israel, but Iran after, uh, Karen, I, I don't want to straight jacket you with the economics. I know you've got a lot to say on the FP as well, but could we, could we just come back to a couple of the challenges around on, on the economic front? So we're dancing between uh, sectors. So, you know, the central bank and the single currency, this idea of a, Khaliji, not a euro. Uh, I'm sitting in London with a sterling post Brexit, um, though it's not doing too bad, may I add. Um, and, and also, uh, you, you, you know, any of these sort of other areas where you think um, there, there were big misses, if you like, um, uh, from, from a, an, an economic standpoint, as, as it were. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily think that the, the failure to create a shared currency was a miss. It was probably a good idea, <laughs> um, you know, but, but there was momentum um, and, you know, through the 2000s that there could be this shared currency, um, that there would be one central bank. Um, you know, these are all economies that in some way have um, have a restricted monetary policy in that they either have um, the value of their currency tied to the US dollar, or in the case of Kuwait, where it's tied to a, a basket of currencies and the price of oil. Um, and so already, you know, there's a pretty, you know, strict um, or, um, you know, not a lot of maneuverability uh, in terms of, of monetary policy. So a common currency wouldn't necessarily make that better. In fact, it might have created more volatility in, um, in, in, in whatever um, gold currency compared to. Could, to Karen, others. could you speak to the central bank point as well, just for those? Yeah, so I mean, the main reason that it failed was really more political in that, um, and that the states didn't want to cede authority, you know, to have um, the, the capital, so to speak, or the monetary capital of the GCC in Saudi Arabia, the UAE didn't like that. And of course, the Omanis were, were kind of, you know, cold to the idea in general. Um, and so we're not really interested in, in that much um, integration, so to speak. So that's why um, the common currency never was, um, never succeeded or never became policy. Um, and I think it's pretty much off the table now. It's not, you know, we've gotten to a point where economic policy across the six uh, states have so much variation 
Um, and that's because, you know, the fundamentals of their economies are very different in terms of demographics, simply the size of the number of citizens that have to be taken care of and what states, what resources states have to, you know, to give services and benefits to citizens. And that's really where we see differences happening. Um, and so that creates different pressures in terms of, um, you know, how open economies might be in terms of um, rights of foreign investors, rights for property ownership, you know, sort of tearing down some of the commercial agency structures, which were basically development policies of the 1960s and 70s that said, hey, you foreign business, bring your franchise, bring your manufacturing, whatever, um, but find a local partner. And in that way, we will generate wealth for citizens and make them owners of business, which has been pretty successful. Um, but in the long term, 40 years later, uh, it's not really necessary anymore in terms of, um, you know, generating wealth for individuals. It's also pretty counterproductive for outside businesses. Absolutely. Um, and so that's, you know, that's coming to a close. Hmm. And so now the competition between states is really more on deregulation. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, it's a mess in some ways. You know, we, we've seen some punitive policies this year. The Saudi Arabia rolled out its headquarters policy, which was very interesting in, in sort of putting a stake in the ground and saying, you know, if you want to do business in the kingdom, you foreign company need to create your regional headquarters here and be committed to being with us um, in terms of you know, having a physical infrastructure, hiring local citizens. Um, and that has softened even mm -hmm. since the announcement. And, and Karen, Karen on, on that point, um, just to link it back to uh, the Qatar crisis issue, how, how, how do investors sitting in, uh, in the US, whether it's New York or Minnesota, or whether, how, how do they view uh, this sort of rift of, you know, you know where, where, where does this leave confidence in terms of the investment landscape? Uh, yeah. you know, in terms of, you know, you, you can't operate here if I'm operating there. And that's sort of, what, quite frankly, value judgment from me, childish and uh, self-defeating behavior. Well, I mean, I think as, as Alham pointed out, I mean, there were very real foreign policy differences um, that, you know, led up to the 2014 dispute and then more severely in 2017. So I don't want to just, you know, push them away as if they were significant. They were and continue to be significant. But the GCC states as, um, as an entity really kind of shot themselves in the foot um, with some of the, the, the policies that, that unwinded in terms of, you know, the, the whole point of having citizens of the six member states being allowed to have bank accounts and own property and own businesses and have the same rights as citizens um, was, was just completely eviscerated. Um, and so the seizure of assets by the central bank and the UAE of, of depositors and, um, and, and entities um, from outside really sent, um, I think, a, a lot of shockwaves into, into investor markets. And, um, and for you know, GCC citizens going forward, you know, how willing will you be um, to put your nest egg uh, across the border within, uh, within the council? Um, knowing that, you know, you might not get to see it or you might not be able to sell your asset or you might not be able to access funds. Um, so that was pretty severe. I think from a foreign business perspective, um, it created a lot of confusion and sort of, again, more redundancy. So you've got to have an office in each capital. Um, you're basically then, you know, fighting for a very small amount of market share. If you do business with one state, are you going to be kept out of opportunities in another? Um, and the rules were not clear, right? Um, and so it became a lot of just sort of guessing, well, you know, if I warm up here and have a relationship, and, uh, is that going to keep me from winning deals um, in another location, in another state? And I think some of that sentiment is still around. Um, and you'll still hear people, individuals, um, very cautious, you know, well, I don't know if I want to be associated with X project or have my name on, uh, you know, on the front page, because then it might, um, you know, jeopardize other relationships. And, and that hasn't gone away. Absolutely. Um, if I can ask colleagues now, um, I know it's very difficult because you're de depth of knowledge, but quick questions, quick answers, because the people have started to warm up. So, um, Abdullah, I'll have, you know, whoever wants to, to sort of take this one on. We have, as you all know, uh, you know tectonic uh, um, shifts last year, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, normalizing with Israel, despite um, a previous commitment to the Arab Peace Initiative. Um, 
And then, of course, we have other states which are either reticent or in the case of, for example, Kuwait, at parliament level, completely against uh, normalizing. I'm adding to the question here. Um, could you say a little bit about what this peace dividend looks like? Or uh, is there a little bit of embarrassment after what we've just seen with the uh, annihilation and demolition of much of Gaza? To, uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, let's uh, you know uh, call uh, things by their uh, uh, proper names. Uh, I don't think this is a peace uh, uh, agreement. Uh, I think uh, you know these countries, um, Bahrain, especially in the Gulf. If you're talking about the Gulf, but even the wider Arab region, they are not in at a war with Israel. Um, uh, I, I think you know they, these are. Uh, completely different. We should look at them completely different from uh, peace peace agreements. Um, it's normalization of uh, and maybe just um, um, making something more obvious that it was actually covered under the table because the relationship between some of these states and Israel have been going on for for a very long time. There is a lot of cooperation between uh, between the two. The 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 question is why now and what is. What is the benefit uh, for, for, for these countries or for the region? Um, I think why now? Because of this, um, you know, change in the global political system with the changes uh, that are uh, taking place, but also in the regional uh, system, there was a push, of course, from the, um, uh, the Trump administration towards that. Um, uh, there is a fear from uh, re-emergence Iran, uh, etc., and there is a fee, uh, there is um, a belief that perhaps uh, Israel would uh, come to support these countries um, in their uh, conflict with uh, Iran, whether you know military military assistance or um, 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 you know other intelligence, uh, uh, etc., and equipment and sophisticated equipment. Um, but it does not really tackle, these agreements do not really tackle the main issue, which is, you know, the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli question. And that is really what is uh, uh, um, the matter. And without that, it's always going to flare up, as we've just seen in, in Gaza, and it will embarrass the, these, these countries. And we've seen how embarrassed they were. Saudi Arabia, basically, that was uh, um, uh, uh, reticent and, and, of course, signing the agreement, but it wouldn't have happened, I think, without a nod from Saudi Arabia, in my opinion, at least, and many other opinions. Um, they, they stopped, uh, there was an acquiescence from them, and they, they stopped the flights. They've allowed Israeli flights, but they stopped it because of Gaza. Um, um, and there were some really very damning um, and, um, you know, messages that came from um, uh, uh, UAE uh, as well. Vis-à-vis, uh, -vis, you know, uh, how Israel is treating uh, Jerusalem and the people in Sheikh uh, Sheikh uh, Jarrah, uh, etc. So I don't know what the benefits are. I think this is going to put the leaders in in, in a very difficult situation with their population uh, as well, because I don't think they have public uh, support, despite the fact there is there is a lot of um, you know uh, push towards making sure that you know the public is behind them. Um, maybe there is some security gains, maybe there is an, uh, an insurance policy uh, and a key to enter into uh, DC and get what you want in terms of uh, security in terms of security uh, arrangements and maybe buying some sophisticated equipment from uh, DC like the uh, F-35, uh, etc. But Thank it's... You, Thank mm. you, Abdullah. Because we have a few minutes left, if we could sort of quick fire. Uh, Ilham, could you, uh, in a minute or two, just tackle the very easy, simple issue of Covadis? Where are we going with Iran? And uh, what would a JCPOA 2.0 or plus look like with throwing ballistic missiles, throwing regional issues and, you know, uh, all the rest of it? And, and if they were to have their cake and eat it. What Karen disagrees, and I, I agree with Karen. But, um, you know, where are things going from a GCC perspective on that? Ticket. Sure. So um, when the JCPOA was first um, was first signed, uh, the Gulf states articulated, well, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they articulated several concerns, primarily that it didn't take into account either Iran's ballistic missile program or its regional power projection in places like Iraq and Lebanon and most 
most of, of most concern to Saudi and Yemen. Um, so they felt that this was this was totally lacking, and I think that's still where they stand. It's not that they're necessarily opposed to the agreement. It's just that they would like to see these issues included in it. For the US, this isn't really on the table. They see the JCPOA as tackling the nuclear issue and then you know, opening the door to subsequent agreements if that happens, but it's really a, a, a nuclear focused issue for them. Um, I think the fact that Saudi and, Ir and Iran are speaking in Baghdad, that there are talks going on there is extremely positive uh, and hopefully that can yield consensus on, on issues like Yemen. Um, uh, I, I think it's perfect a perfect segue. <laughs> if, Karen, um, two things if you could sort of touch on it in, 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 uh, in, in very briefly, as briefly as you can, uh, very simple, easy topics. Um, where are we going with Yemen? What next for Yemen? What role for the GCC? And more broadly, maybe we can bring in Syria into this. And are there wins for um for, for the GCC at, at you know post-war reconstruction level? You know, what, what does burden sharing look like on the economic front? Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of talk now about um, creating more of a development or humanitarian mechanism for post-conflict reconstruction led or, or integrated through the GCC in Yemen and perhaps in other, um, other geographies as well. I'm not very optimistic about that, um, firstly, because of the way that um, humanitarian aid has flowed from uh, the GCC states into you know, all manner of conflict, but particularly into Yemen. It's been strongly um, kind of um, controlled, but also um, really even isolated from multilateral systems from the international aid community. So the idea that all of a sudden the GCC could become the, the vehicle or the vector for you know, shared resources, I, I, I don't see it happening. Um, I, I think it's a nice idea, but I, I think it's it's not practical. Um, and in terms of you know Syria, same thing, even worse, right? Because you know the, the way that the opportunities that um, that will be created in terms of you know contracting firms, construction firms, whatever, um, you know they have very specific con constituencies of people who who want to win those awards and uh and that's that's going to be um that's going to be a tight race thank you so much karen uh, abdullah I, I got a question uh anonymous question and if you could touch on this as you've seen there's been a lot of um oman where bellwethers in the space as we know but almost everybody's a mediator nowadays in the gulf right um from uh, from uh, uh, Kashmir to Darfur back when, uh, and so on and so forth. So one of the questions is, you know, how could Biden's foreign policy approach towards MENA, which prefers diplomacy over the use of force, uh, but also deprioritize the region compared to other theaters, the Indo-Pacific, New Term, and Europe, uh, how, do, how, do, how can this impact uh, GCC's diplomatic and mediating role in the future? As you know, um, it's always, uh, as you know, uh, uh, small countries uh, sometimes find themselves there not necessarily without agency. They try and, and um, you know, create some soft power for themselves and mediation is one way of doing that. So we've seen, especially the small uh, countries in the Gulf, uh, Oman, um, um, Kuwait and Qatar, uh, in particular, playing a lot of mediation uh, uh, efforts in, uh, in the region. And I think they have done, you know, to a certain extent, a great job in terms of, you know, um, uh, at least helping to resolve some, uh, some of the crisis. And I don't think that is going to stop. I think that is part of the way that they see, uh, they project their own power uh, or the, uh, at least the soft power. And I think now with the uh, Biden administration, new uh, policy towards the Middle East, there is a room for uh, these countries to do more. And we see that, you know, that this is uh, really taking place. Uh, as you know, uh, we're just talking about Yemen. We've seen how Oman is playing a very important role in that. Uh, we've seen the UN um, representative and U.S. representative to Yemen are actually you know, flying in and out of Oman. Uh, we've seen how uh, Qatar has also been doing a lot of uh, good stuff, even with the United States and Afghanistan. Um, we've seen also Kuwait trying to do this. I think this is going to continue. And I think the more diplomacy we can uh, use in the region, I think the better, because only through dialogue and diplomacy 
policy and negotiation that we can resolve our conflict. And we don't need wars. We don't need any more uh, conflict because it's very costly. Uh, and, um, and the region is facing huge challenges uh, in, in the future. And the last thing they want to go for is, you know, this prolonged conflict that wastes those resources for necessary, for no end and we've seen you know that we are uh, the region actually is suffering because of that and given of course all these visions that um, these countries want to do and the development that, uh, and the, uh, the fact that they want to create jobs for their uh, young population they really need to change they need a paradigm shift in the way that they uh, start to look into this and i think um, uh, mediation is one way and negotiation of course and diplomacy uh, should be supreme uh, in the region. It should be supported. Thank, thank you, Abdel. Before, before going to Ilham uh, on, a, on, on a Turkey question, if I may, uh, Abdel, if you could give us a yes, no on the following. Um, full disclosure, you're from Oman. Um, protests going on. We know about the economic situation or the macroeconomics. Karen would speak to debt profiles and so on and so forth. But um, it's a question that was sort of going on and on under the, 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 the late Sultan Qaboos. With his successor in place now, and with potential financial support going forward from Gulf Brothers neighbors, do we see potential um, redux or uh, um, I don't know, je ne sais quoi, of uh, a reform of the Oman's foreign policy profile or neutrality becoming not so neutral anymore? As a sort of quick yes, no on that, uh, Abdullah. Uh, no, I think this is Oman will continue to do what it does because I think. This is this is its role, and this is how it sees its role uh, in the region. And you know, it's it's uh, really involved in this uh, omni balancing game that has always to balance off, you know, regional powers and try to create peace and so on. So I don't think it's going. It might change at the edges and the way that they do it and the style, but the content will stay the same. Uh, uh, it's also Omani culture uh, uh, as well and the history of the country that. Um, you know, try and avoid conflict and try to mediate and uh, create peace uh, and tranquility. Thank, thank you, Abdullah. Um, Ilham, Turkey have an agreement with the Kuwaitis, military or defense agreement rather. They have a base in Qatar, uh, which of, of course was, uh, uh, you know, to the chagrin of, uh, you know, fellow colleagues who, uh, you know, the crisis in 2017. Where, where, what is Turkey's role in the region? We're seeing some quasi rapprochement around the region. Where is this going? We are. I think um, this is this is very positive. We are seeing um, a move towards diplomacy in general. Um, relations between Egypt and Turkey have improved. I think if we just look at Saudi Arabia, the Turkish foreign minister visited last month. So did the Qatari emir. Um, talked with Iran. Talks as well. Well, diplomatic engagement with Syria. I think that in itself tells us that there is more of a shift towards diplomacy, um, and that being taken seriously as an option um, by 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 regional actors. That's. That's the shift, I think, not just in the Gulf, but a bit broader than that, um, which hopefully we'll see more of. Thank you so much. Karen, I know you've done a lot of excellent work and, and, and I'll plug your tracker, but on, on aid and investment in places like the Horn, Egypt, and many of the places absorbing regional rents from 2011 onwards and of course before, how has that changed over time in terms of you know, aid coming with conditions or you know, cooperation and competition in the aid space? Uh, whether it's Qatar's 500 million to Gaza or UAE and, uh, of course, uh, Saudi, Kuwait with Egypt and so on and so forth. How, how is this evolving or developing? Well, I mean, these are tools that, um, that these states now are more willing to use, right? The question is, do they have the resources to you know, extend them externally or is there more competition to put them at home? Um, and so I think the next, you know, couple of years are going to be very interesting. Maybe we're getting into the last super cycle um, of oil prices. Oil prices are going to go up. They're going to have a little bit more in terms of, uh, of, um, of fiscal space or, or budget to, um, to either move towards those diversification goals or to, um, to achieve foreign policy goals, right? You can't do everything. So I think that's really the question for, you know, the next I don't know, two, five years, um, and how this unfolds. And certainly there will be a, a wider variation um, in, in ability and resources. So what Saudi Arabia and the UAE can do, what Qatar can do is very different than what Kuwait or Oman or Bahrain can achieve. 
Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, as always, questions start filing in at the end, but we do have a, a relatively hard stop. Just for, for full disclosure, we have questions on, on China's role, the C word that we can never forget, and the role of the belt uh, and road, greening the belt, and the role of the Gulf states, who are mostly signatories. But also, um, uh, you know, questions on, um, uh, on, on Turkey and dispute, resu re uh, dis dispute resolution. But um, if we could end, uh, if, if, uh, if okay with our speakers, just in your sort of one minute sort of final thought, if you could provide us with one, either a lesson or a takeaway or a suggestion in the game of policy prescription for the GCC as it's entered its fifth decade, what could bring together um, uh, these, uh, th these countries for better? And, I, and I'll, I'll end with a quote from my, myself before passing it on to, to Abdullah and we'll go the same. Uh, Sheikh Zayed opened the first 40 minute summit of the GCC with the world. What the Arab world expects of us is serious solidarity cooperation and loyalty. Um, Abdullah, what can be done to, to, to sort of close ranks on, on Sheikh Zayed's uh, uh, words of wisdom and, and aspiration back, back when? Yeah, I, I think what uh, is needed beyond, of course, you know, revising the, uh, the charter and, and doing all the work that is needed is we need a GCC champions. We need some leaders who actually believe in regional integration. We need to define what does it mean. Do we follow the EU model or do we create our own? Do we want to be Eurocentric or uh, create, uh, you know, an indigenous uh, cooperation? Uh, we need, you know, the Conrad Adnauer, the, uh, uh, the Jean Mouché, and of course we need, uh, you know, the Gasperi and the Spinelli uh, uh, of Italy to lead this uh, further. And, and unfortunately, we don't have that. We have very conflicting, uh, you know, big conflict between uh, the leaders, despite Al Ola, uh, you know, there is still uh, a lot going on, unfortunately, under the surface. And until that has happened, and we have someone like Sheikh Zayed and, uh, and some of the founding fathers, uh, it's, we are going to be in the same place, unfortunately. Thank you for that wonderful uh, note. <laughs> Stop being sarcastic. Thanks, Abdullah. Il Ilham, uh, over to you. That's a wonderful grand vision that I, I can't beat. So um, I think I'll try to contribute in a more technical micro way. I think we should strengthen GCC dispute resolution mechanisms in the charter and, and really um, ensure that those are, are strong and that they're followed um, rather than being ignored at every, at every, um, uh, at every crisis. Um, strengthening the role of regional mediators as well, uh, maybe having a separate forum for this kind of thing um, at the technical level, just doing what we can to to improve integration and mediation. Thank you so much, Ilham. Karen, last words to you. I guess I don't really see more integration as uh, as feasible. I mean, given the current kind of national political systems, um, but I think one way that you know could be strengthened and, and to avoid some of the conflicts we saw in 2017 is to uphold the rights of, of citizens in, in member states. I think that would be the most important um, and, and sort of practical mechanism um, that would at least give people more confidence in, in, um, in their ability to, to move about and, um, and have you know, economic activities that, that are you know, not wasted. Thank you, Karen. And, and I'm going to throw my two pence worth in, which is the, e, the EU GCC FDA had political and human rights conditionality, and that was one of the sticking points. And of course, we hear from the Biden admin that multilateralism and human rights are back. But on that point, if we want to uh, speak down or encourage colleagues in the region to improve these uh, records, they, they can't be selective and they have to be all around the region with no exception. And uh, I think everybody knows what I'm on about there. But um, on, on that last point, I'd like to, to, to ask you to, to please consult the ISPI website for upcoming events, including an, an upcoming webinar on China and the Gulf on June 8th at 10 a.m. CST Rome time. And, uh, and, and in a usual way, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your wonderful questions, though they all started piling in at the end. I'd like to thank our wonderful speakers and friends, uh, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Ilham, Dr. Karen, um, and, and a special thanks to, to ISPI colleagues, uh, Beatrice, Federico, uh, Valeria and Annalisa. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful, um, a, a wonderful week and weekend. And I'm sure we'll back, be back to do this and discuss everything else under the sun very soon. Uh, thanks so much. And, and wherever you are, enjoy the sunshine or at least um, an opening. Uh, thanks very much. Take care. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, everyone.